out on a great adventure The day my father started leading me home He said there's gonna be some mountains to climb And some valleys we're gonna go through In our civilization, we have got so far away from covenant You see, everything is ink and paper Everything is ink and paper Ink and paper is not worth the paper it was written on Because it's ink and paper you see, if there's a business contract in this time when David was alive and you and somebody said, oh, well, eh, contracts are made to be broken, they would kill you for that. They would, and they would, I'm not, they would kill you for that. Uh, a marriage contract, they would actually, it was in the thumb at that time, they would actually cut the person's thumb and then after they cut it all the way around, they would put spices in there to make it fester so that it would raise up and turn color. And so that every time you've ever done anything, if you waved at somebody, you see, covenant is made with blood and pain. Covenant is made with blood and pain. You don't easily forget. There's always a blessing associated with a covenant there's always a curse associated with a covenant. If you break a covenant, then it's death. But if you keep a covenant, then it is life to you. That's how it really works. Well, uh, for sake of time, let me move forward here to 2 Samuel 9. Turn there, because this, um, this is a lot right here. <clears throat> I remember David Smith, when he shared at my house several weeks back, he, he mentioned Mephibosheth. No. Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. Why did he name him that, right? Mephibosheth. 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 Everybody say that with me. Mephibosheth. Yeah. Now you know who I'm talking about, even if I say it wrong. Listen, uh, for the sake of time, let me just let me tell you what's going on here. But you read it this week. Uh, David is king of Israel and Judah at this point. Jonathan, who we read about back there, is dead. Saul and Jonathan are both dead. And David, now remember, David is a type of Jesus. David is is showing us into the Old Covenant somewhat of what Jesus will be like under the New Covenant. You see, we live under a New Covenant. We live under, it is a magnificent covenant. And that's what we'll get into next week, but we've got to understand the whole thing about me saying, you know, our civilizations have gotten away from blood covenant is so that we've got to understand where these things come from. We've got to understand what they really mean. And here we have David, a shepherd, and he's not, he hasn't been to seminary. He's not part of the Levitical priesthood. But what David has is the fact that he knows God's Hasid. He knows what God has done for him. It's in his heart, you see. He understands. David was a king, so the Holy Spirit was on him. Everybody else didn't have that privilege under the Old Covenant. But we all do. We all do. We have the privilege of the Holy Spirit. But what David is saying here, and if you look at it in verse 1, he's, he called, uh, well, it may not be verse 1, but let me just tell you what it says. He called a servant who used to be in the house of Saul. Stay with me just a minute here now, guys. This, I'll make it quick. He, stay, he called a servant that was in the house of Saul. His name was Ziba. He said, Ziba, is there anybody that I can show God's Hasid to? I mean covenant with Jonathan. Jonathan's dead. You see? But the thing about it is, David knows this. The only witness to that covenant was Jonathan, David, and God. But you, so, but you see, he invoked the name of God. Just like when you go to court and you raise your hand and somebody says, so help me God. A lot of people think, well, that's no big deal. Oh, that's a big deal. Yeah. You lie right there and God knows it. You see, new covenant, old covenant. God knows. It. He says, Ziba, 
There's somebody, surely, in the house of in the house of Saul that I can show God's Hasid to. His kindness. I have a covenant that I need to honor. You see, it was burning inside of him. David here being a type of Jesus, our elder brother, who went to Calvary and cut covenant with God the Father. That's what all that leads to. You see, that covenant was cut between God and God. There are no weaknesses in our covenant. That's the amazing thing. So stay with it here. But now this covenant is cut between a man and a man. You see, one of the reasons why we have such a hard time with covenant is, is that we don't think somebody else is trustworthy because we might not be trustworthy. Amen. Yeah, and that's the truth. Well, if I was in that situation... I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't honor that. Yeah? That's because you're a man. But if you're in covenant, you would understand it's a whole lot better for me to honor that than it is for me not to because I will benefit from that. You see, God still watches His Word. And He will come down and perform whatever His Word is put out to do. So the scriptures we use all the time. Anyway, the servant of Saul said... Uh, Ziba said, yeah, there is one, Mephibosheth, and he's crippled in both feet. What happened is, is Mephibosheth was in the house of Saul. Now, all these years, Saul had said, David is an evil man. David just wants the kingdom. David will kill everybody in here. David is an awful man. Just like people say, God wants to kill you. God will do this to you. God will do that to you. God will do this to you. David had the same reputation as God. That's what he's telling us here. You read the whole story. You see, David had the reputation in the house of Saul of being an evil man. Hard man. And let's, let's face it, David had killed tens of thousands of people. But he'd done it all for Israel. He'd done it all for God. He didn't do it of his own account. He'd done what God told him to do. So, when David found out he sent some people to get Mephibosheth. Now you can imagine, here this man is, Mephibosheth. And here comes David's army. The strongest, most fierce, most feared fighting machine on the face of the earth at this time. And here they're coming for you. And you're of the house of Saul. And the only thing you've ever been taught is how ruthless David is. I'm sure Mephibosheth thought, I wonder what he has thought up for me. I bet you that there's a golden spit and he's going to stick a rotisserie all the way through me and he's going to barbecue me alive. That's what Mephibosheth probably thought. And if you read some other translations, you get that because when they brought Mephibosheth in, Mephibosheth, you got to be careful there, uh, he threw himself down. He walked with, with canes because both his legs were crippled because a maid had run in, grabbed him, dropped him on the way out of the palace, probably broke his back, whatever. Uh, he was paralyzed not completely because he did have children, Mephibosheth did. But he was paralyzed to the point where his feet didn't work. So we don't know exactly what all that means. But anyway, he fell down and he said, uh, and David said, Mephibosheth, is that you? And he said, it is, it is I, uh, king, master. He said, you know, get up, boy. He said, I've been looking for you. I've been looking for you because I want to get good to you. He said, uh, and uh, Mephibosheth said, well, what do you want with a dog like me? See, King David didn't even respond to that. Because he said, he was, and then I'm sure in his mind he's thinking, here this young man is thinking I'm getting ready to kill him in some horrendous way. You know, I'm a dead dog. But all the while, David's had this burning inside of him to complete the covenant, to honor the covenant, because it's an important thing, you see. So he raised him up. He said, uh, listen, to shorten the story here, everything that Saul had, is now yours. Everything that Jonathan had is now yours. He said, Ziba, he said, let me tell you something, boy. 
He said, you've got 15 sons and 20 servants. You work for this man every day the rest of your life. You put money in his coffers. You work his feet. And this man, at this moment, Mephibosheth went from being a pauper to one of the richest men in Israel. Just like that, at the word of the king. Do you know what that's like? That's like the moment you said, Jesus, come into my heart. Amen. You went from being a pauper to being a wealthy man or wealthy woman in the kingdom of God. Your father owns it all. And he doesn't withhold from his children. That is nonsense. That is not what the covenant teaches. In fact, if you study covenants of any civilization, the covenants were always for a good purpose for those who entered into the covenant. It, you know, yes, there are curses. Don't misunderstand me. There are. There are bad things that will happen to people if they violate the covenant. That is true. In fact, Paul said it, and I, I said it last week in the New Testament. For this reason, people have died early and are sick, and it's because it's because of breaking the covenant. Now, don't misunderstand. Just because somebody's sick doesn't mean they've necessarily broken the covenant. That's not what I'm saying. It's one of the reasons. We have an enemy in this world as well. We've got to discern where, where it's coming from, what the difference is. I know Newell asked me this morning, you know, are we going to do communion anytime soon? The answer is yes. I wanted to get through this covenant teaching because I want people to understand. I want myself to understand. When I take that covenant when I take that piece of bread, when I take that grape juice or wine, such another foolish thing that people... Well, anyway. Uh, when I take that, you see, I want to know why I'm taking it. Because I'm going to tell you, you can, you can be all kind of sick in your body. But if you take covenant with God, you remember the forefront of His mind. That's what the covenant is when we're doing that. You're saying, God, what Jesus did on Calvary, I accept that. I am in covenant with you. I accept your Hasid, your agape. I take that on, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that you Amen. did that for me. You see, that's what we're doing there. Anyway, um, David said, from now on, you will eat at my table with Pippashev. You see, another type. From now on, you don't have to die with Pippashev. You can actually have it right here and now. Now, if he'd have been under the new covenant, David would have reached out, took him, and he would have walked to that table. But they, but they wasn't under the new covenant. They were under the old covenant. You see, we have a better covenant. Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. We're no longer under the Abrahamic covenant. We're no longer under the Mosaic law. We're not under the Noad laws. We are under grace and mercy from Jesus himself, the Son of God, the third part of the Godhead. I mean, he is awesome. As Ernest Wheaton would say, he is awesome. And he, and he has provided everything for you. Understand, you see, we call this the New and the Old Testament. I'm, I'm closing right here. And unfortunately, that word has lost its meaning in our modern day vernacular. Yeah, it's, it's a testament. It is a testament. And testament means the same thing as covenant, but we've lost the power of that. You see, we're, we're several generations away from the actual blood. It's all ink and paper. But we can consciously go there. We can know, you know what? Jesus did spill that blood. He did ascend into heaven. And he put that blood on the Hasid seat. That's the seat he put it on. It's the Hasid seat. And that covers everything. And we get those provisions from him. Stand to your feet.